Okay, so we can start next lecture. This is going to be the first by Leonardo Rastelli, who is going to talk about the Carroll algebra program for four dimensional superconforming field theories. So, please. between n equal to 2 um, four-dimensional super conformal field theories, or SCFTs for short, and um, two-dimensional um, chiral algebras, or um, as uh, mathematicians uh, would prefer to call them vertex operator algebras. I will, I will use the uh, two names interchangeably. So um, it's a by now rather rich and complicated story and it will be impossible for me to completely do it just in four lectures. And although I was told that this is supposed to be a very advanced audience, I didn't quite, uh, perhaps we should wait. People are still coming in. I didn't quite uh, had the courage uh, to assume that you already know everything about n equal to two field theories. Uh, and uh, so I will start today with a rather pedagogic and elementary overview of n equal to two superconformal field theories in four dimensions, uh, partly as a way of motivation, okay? So our work, um, so I, I can say it in a slogan. So we have this rich landscape of four dimensional theories with n equal to two supersymmetry. It's a growing list. It's um, in a way much richer than the maximally supersymmetric case, which is n equals to four, which is more constrained, um, but still has sufficient structure to allow uh, remarkable analytic progress. And um, much progress has been done, but what we will describe is a particular subsector of, uh, of these complicated theories, which turns out to be uh, isomorphic to something very tractable. So, you're familiar with chiral algebras. Chiral algebras are the purely uh, holomorphic left-moving set of a two-dimensional conformal field theory, so meromorphy is, is very powerful. And uh, this correspondence has uh, many uses. Uh, as always often is the case with this kind of, uh, of correspondence or dualities, the error both is powerful both ways. We can use the fact that the bottom uh, line is tractable and has infinite dimensional amount of symmetry to uh, find interesting results, interesting exact results of four-dimensional theories. And we can use physical intuition about four-dimensional theory in the other direction to uh, formulate mathematical results about two-dimensional uh, Carl algebra, which you can then hand to mathematicians and they will prove theorems. And perhaps the most ambitious uh, goal uh, which uh, will really is my current focus, and uh, do, this will be uh, ambitiously the, the punchline of these lectures, is to use this correspondence as an organizing principle for the whole landscape of, uh, of uh, so the idea is to use this as an organizing principle and perhaps even as a, uh, the beginning of a classification program. Okay, so uh, this is all great, but I think it would be a little premature for me to just jump into the structure without any motivation. So as a way of motivation, I will, uh, I will describe today in a uh, really lightening way uh, the basic structure of n equal to two theories in four dimensions, and I will do it from, um, so the outline for today will be a review of 
n equal to two superconformal field theories. And optimistically, I will start with basic stuff such as uh, we will start with baby steps, uh, familiar vanilla type of n equal to theories. I have a Lagrangian formulation, and then I will promote a more abstract viewpoint based on superconformal representation theory. And I will tell you how the algebra of local operators uh, is useful. That would be my basic organizing principle, and try to connect that also with the geometry of vacuum branches. OK, so that's a little ambitious, but um, uh, we need to start somewhere. OK, so uh, I assume the basis of supersymmetry. I just want to remind you of the basic, uh, basic elements. So, um, so there are two types of, uh, of supersymmetric multiplets that we will consider. We will consider the n equal to 2 vector multiplet, which in familiar um, component language consists of a complex scalar phi and two uh, gauge genus lambdas. So phi is a complex scalar. And so I will also use the notation lambda i alpha, where i goes from 1 to 2. So just to, OK, so again, I'm, I need to assume you know the basics of supersymmetry. Let me write the supersymmetry algebra in. So we have two copies. of a SUSY algebra. So the index i is an SU2R index. So this is the art symmetry of the theory. The full art symmetry of the theory um, is really a U2, which we will decompose into an SU2 times a U1R. And my notation throughout these lectures will be very consistent. I will always denote with capital R the non-abelian art symmetry and with uh, small r the abelian one. And also by abuser notation, I will often denote by R the cartan of SU2R and by little r the generator of you want R. And those of you who are familiar with n equal one supersymmetry, in terms of n equal one multiplets, we can decompose the n equal two vector multiplets into an n equal one vector and into an n equal one chiral superfields. OK, so it's clear that if you have not seen this before, this is going to be meaningless to so you. I'm just doing it as a way of recap notation and, uh, and also because I will, I will need some of this notation to uh, write down a few examples. Um, so this is the vector multiple that contains the gauge fields, which I'm writing here in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, sp by spinorial notation. And so necessarily, by the general principle of quantum field theory, the moment you have a massless uh, spin one object, uh, you must have gauge symmetry. This is a famous result uh, from the old days. And, um, and so necessarily, the n equal to vector multiplet has indices I have not written down. It transforms in the adjoint representation of some group G, which we're going to be the gauge group. The um, other multiplet I'm going to write is going to well let, let me let me do it in a slightly uh, in a slightly more precise way than it's often done. I'm going to write the n equal to two half hypermultiplet. 
um, which will be a, um, let me try to be precise, it's going to be, again, a complex scalar Q. and a vial fermion that I'm going to know psi alpha and CPT conjugation does not leave this multiplet invariant. There's a whole discussion that I need to shortcut a bit, but um, if you look at the uh, representations of one particle states, which hopefully you're familiar with that story where you construct uh, you know, you go to the, um, you look at masses representations, you consult this Clifford vacuum and combine different representations in such a way that they are CPT self-conjugate. It almost looks like this one is CPT self-conjugate, but it, it's, that's not quite the case. And the reason for it is that the, uh, necessarily will find a pseudo real representation of SU2R the fundamental presentation of SU2R. So in order for this object to make sense, uh, really one must consider a whole pseudo-real representation under some other group. Let me call it G. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be necessarily the same as the gauge group. Uh, there has to be some uh, additional. So this is uh, forces this guy to be in a pseudo real representation, in some pseudo real representation R, which is pseudo real. Of G tilde, and then the whole thing can be made CPT self-conjugate. Okay, so for those of you who are uh, slightly puzzled by this, so the more um, uh, the most familiar case of this situation is one where we consider a full hyper, which will consist of two half hypers. A half hyper, uh, you will have recognized, it's really the same thing as, as uh, n equal one chiral superfield. And we are con going to consider a full hyper where we consider this in representation R and this in representation R star. And then in the R times R star, there's a natural pseudo real. Okay, but the most general situation is the one where I, that I outlined there, where we are not necessarily assuming that we have two different copies in two, in two complex conjugate representation. We may have a situation where we have a honest pseudo real representation, which cannot be written as a direct sum of uh, two complex conjugate representations. Okay, so. Uh, with this data, you can now start constructing Lagrangians. And again, um, I'm not um, going to really be able to do, I mean, um, truth be told, the, what people usually do is write uh, even n equal to Lagrangian n equal one superspace and then the covariant ties with respect to the non-abelian art symmetry. That's still the most efficient way to do it because n equal to two superspace is a bit cumbersome. There's a nice simple construction. So let, this is a side note. n equal to two superspace is natural and easy for the n equal to two vector, but uh, it's a bit hard for the n equal to two hyper or half hyper because uh, it requires an infinite number of, um, of auxiliary fields. For the vector, there's a nice, simple way of doing it that I just want to mention briefly. 
you introduce Grassmann coordinates, theta i alpha, where i again is 1 to 2 and alpha is my, um, is my um, index, uh, is my uh, vial index, and then you write down the full superfield, again by abuser notation, the full, you write down a full chiral superfield in this n equal to 2 superspace, so it depends only on the thesis and not on the, uh, on the theta bars, and the expansion of this guy will contain the um, gay genus that we saw earlier, uh, and then uh, there will be, at the theta square component, you will find the gauge field, uh, and then there will also be a piece that contains a, a triplet, an SU2 triplet of auxiliary fields, okay? So I'm mentioning this briefly because it will allow me to save a little bit of time later. In the more familiar n equal one notation, this triplet of auxiliary fields will be written So in n equal one notation, they would be even by the familiar F, F bar, and the auxiliary fields of the two chiral, of the chiral superfield and of the n equal one beta superfield. So, um, so it turns, yes. Yes, of course, I'm sorry. Um, I, ah, I was just a type, sorry. Okay, so again, I'm shortcutting this whole discussion, but uh, let me just uh, assert the following, that um, if we, um, at the classical level, at, at the level of writing down classical Lagrangians, if we insist that they are classically scale invariant, then if you fix uh, the matter content, which means you fix the gauge group and you fix the representation under which the half hyper transform, then uh, the Lagrangian is unique up to choice of the gauge coupling. Okay, so, so the basic data of an n equal to two Lagrangian are choice of G which a priori can be a product, where each gi is a simple vector, or at this classical level, it could also be a u1. And then a choice of a representation r for g, which by the uh, quick, um, not really argument, but the quick assertion I had earlier must be should the real. Okay. So the simplest, and just to belabor the point I made earlier, the simplest and cheapest way to construct a pseudo real representation of G is to take R to be the direct sum uh, of, um, let's call them, uh, well, let's call them R prime of two uh, representations, R prime and, it, and its complex conjugate R prime star, but more general possibilities, possibilities are allowed. And so these are the discrete data, and then um, it turns out the n equal, to two supersymmetry fixes the Lagrangian uniquely. For the vector multiple, that's very easy to believe because you just take the familiar uh, Lagrangian for n equal one vector multiple, it's in your covariant ties with respect to SU2. Remember, we had two lambdas, lambda one and lambda two. You covariant ties the n equal one Lagrangian, you get the right answer. Another way of writing 
the, the, the Lagrange for the vector multiple is to write it using this simple superspace, which you can do easily. Uh, the construction of the full Lagrange, including matter, is a little bit more involved. Uh, but a cheap way of saying what you need to do, you do minimal coupling. Okay? So you have, you have the familiar story in uh, um, where you want to couple the gauge field uh, minimally to the, uh, to the nether current under the symmetry. And you want, to, uh, you want to write down an n equal to 2 SUSY version of minimal coupling. And that can be done, although the details in superspace are a little bit involved, so I'm not going to write it there, write, write it down. But what you're doing in, in, uh, in simple terms, you are, uh, and we will come back to that in a minute because it will, uh, right now I'm, I'm unfortunately painfully slowly just reviewing basic Lagrangian uh, territory and I will graduate soon to a more abstract presentation. The way to do it is to recognize that the conserved current really belongs to a, to a full superfield. So we're going to view the conserved current J mu, or in the notation I had earlier, J alpha alpha dot, as a member of a superfield. And this superfield, again, you take my word, and later we will, we will uh, do this in a little bit more detail, has as top component, or according to how you count, bottom component, a, uh, a element which has dimension 2, and it's an SU2R triplet. And then there will be some fermions, which I'm not writing down. And at the next level, you will find when you add with two supercharges, you will find the current and also a complex scalar. So in n equal to 2 theory, you write j alpha alpha dot as the action of two supercharges, two-point carry supercharging, acting on this um, bottom component of the superfield, which for reasons that come from geometry and that perhaps will become familiar to some of you and later on we will quickly review, is also known as the moment map operator. Okay? So once you have recognized that the current you want to call minimally to the gauge field has this nice n equal to covariantization, what you basically want to write down is some souped-up version of this where you couple the full n equal to 2 vector to this, uh, this full-fledged, let's call it mu, uh, conserved current superfield. And this fixes uniquely the coupling of the matter to the gauge field. Okay? Under which assumptions? Well, under the assumption that the theory is classically scale invariant, so I'm not allowing for mass terms. And as always is the case, each simple factor, each simple factor of the, um, each simple factor of the gauge group, comes with uh, comes with the choice of complexified um, complexified gauge coupling in the standard fashion. Okay, so to summarize, to write down a, scale, a classically scale invariant n equal to 2 Lagrange, and you choose a product gauge group, a pseudo real representation of this product gauge group, and for each simple factor, or, or a priori one factor, you choose a complex parameter tau, which lives in the complex upper half plane, because the coupling is assumed to be, of course, real. Now, um, as we graduate to quantum field theory, um, uh, 
uh, various choices are possible, and um, it is certainly allowed to consider general, much more general type of structures uh, if you are interested in viewing these Lagrangians as low energy effective field theories. But my focus here right now in writing down uh, UV complete models uh, that uh, make sense uh, as you stipulate them uh, to short distance. Uh, and so um, you will recall that U1 um, has a, famously has a positive beta function, and so it's not well defined in the UV. So we will insist, so in writing n equal to 2 quantum superconformal field theories, we will uh, dismiss the U1s. And so then uh, these are the data. The same discrete data as before, and then a set of continuous um, gauge couplings. Now, it turns out that non-perturbative dualities will carve out generically a smaller subset of these complexified gauge couplings because uh, there will be discrete identification in this space uh, so that theories uh, related by the discrete identification are in fact physically equivalent. So, uh, so the complexified gauge problem will a priori should be modded out by some duality group. Let me give you an example. Um, n equal 4 to pay mills is a special case of uh, n equal to 2 theory and there you, we have a single uh, a non abelian gauge group G, uh, and uh, we take R to be the adjoint representation of G. We have a single complexified gauge coupling, but famously, there is a uh, SL2Z invariance that restricts the uh, physically um, distinct values of tau to the um, fundamental domain of SL2Z. Okay? In that case, the duality group is SL2Z. Okay, so um, the, um, sorry, um, I, I, since I need to pace myself, I want a quick raise of hand. Who among you already knew everything about this? So it's actually not a, it's less than half, so I'm, I'm glad I'm not completely wasting your time. So, um, okay, so the next um, step, uh, if you are interested in, um, in uh, conformally, okay, so I already uh, made an assumption that I want to exclude the U1 factors because they lead to inconsistency in the far UV, and I'm, I'm right, trying to write down something which is, uh, a fundamental Lagrangian description, not some low energy description. Of course, those of you who are familiar with, say, Sabe Witten theory know that there's, of course, very much beautiful use of uh, U1 gauge fields if you view your Lagrangian as, a, as in a derivative expansion, as a low energy effective action. And then, of course, the Lagrangian is a lot more complicated than what I wrote down. I should have also emphasized when I said n equal to 2 supersymmetry fixes the Lagrange uniquely, it fixes the um, there are various ways of saying this. It fixes the renormalizable Lagrange uniquely, or if you assume that you have sc classical scale invariance, of course, all the higher irrelevant operators are forbidden, and so you have a unique structure. But if you don't make this assumption, then you can have a complicated derivative expansion, and then n equal to supersymmetry only relates some terms, but it does not fix the Lagrange uniquely. The, uh, if you are now interested in promoting the story to a full quantum story, we need to make sure that the Scale invariant is preserved. Remember, our goal is conformal field theories, with in particular scale invariant. So we may, do may, do we may need to make sure that the, uh, that the beta function is zero. And uh, there is a beautiful simplification that happens here. It is sufficient to check the vanishing of the uh, one-loop beta function. Okay, so a quick heuristic argument for the vanishing of the, uh, of the higher perturbative terms 
comes from holomorphy. Uh, you know that n equal one theories have a holomorphic scheme where only the, uh, the running is one loop. That holomorphic scheme, however, introduces a wave function normalizations for the, for the terms that appear in the Keller potential. And so it's not the usual physical scheme where, uh, where the chiral superfields are canonically normalized. But thankfully, n equal to two supersymmetry relates that piece of the Lagrangian with the vector piece of the Lagrangian. And so you know that that is actually the physical scheme in which, uh, in which simultaneous you can have holomorphic and absence of the wave function normalization. And then holomorphic, remember tau was this combination 4 pi i over g square plus theta over 2 pi. Holomorphic allows you to quickly conclude that you cannot have uh, loop corrections be beyond, beyond one loop because they would have to depend on the imaginary part of tau, so they would not be holomorphic. So we simply need to impose a vanishing of the one loop beta function, which, of course, for the U1 factors, that could never be possible, and that's why we discarded them. And then for each simple factor, GI in my product gauge group, so let me not put the index I for, to avoid uh, cluttering, there will be a negative contribution uh, that comes from the um, vector multiplet. A check is the dual Coxeter number of, my, of the particular simple. I'm, I'm writing the full gauge group as a product. And then uh, this is the dual Coxeter number of the particular factor GI I'm, for each I. I'm doing this, and then uh, you get a contribution from the uh, half hyperts, which is, turns out to be the index of the representation half. This is the notation which is proper for half hyperts. So for example, if I take G to be SUN, the dual Coxeter number is N, and I'm using conventions where the index of the fundamental representation is one half, and the index of the adjoint representation is n. And so now we can check familiar examples of n equal to Lagrangian field theories. So I wrote that formula for half hyperts. And I'm sorry for being a little bit pedantic about half hyperts, but I'll tell you a little secret. So, um, so people claim to have classified uh, all, um, all Lagrangian uh, uh, n equal to super conformal field theories. Uh, and it turned out they had made a little mistake. They had missed one that, uh, because they had not been careful about this business of half hyperts. So it's actually something that one should always keep in mind. So I wrote, the, I wrote this for half pi, but of course, if you, for full hypers, which is the simple, which is the simple, the simplest um, situation, then we would, we would just put it twice there, obviously. And so if I take G equal SUN, there are two familiar ways in which you can satisfy this condition. You can either have uh, an F equal 2n uh, fundamental representation. You can just check that this works out. Minus 2 little n uh, plus 2 times 2n times 1 half gives you 0. Or you could, or you could have uh, 1 adjoint. Uh, and this is what we would call n equal to 2 super QCD. And this is the case in which, in fact, the supersymmetry enhances to the full n equals to 4. OK. So uh, another little exercise you can do is, um, so um, convince yourself, which can be done by explicit calculation, 
that the um, one, the one loop coefficient of the beta function also controls the anomaly of the U1R. Okay, so remember, classically, we have this SU2R times uh, U1R symmetry in the Lagrangian. Uh, if I don't break the classical conformal invariant by my terms, this is the true symmetry of the classical Lagrangian. And this is manifestly preserved by quantum effects, but the U1R is broken by the anomaly, but the anomaly is actually proportional to the beta function. This is a, something you can quickly do if you recall that under a uh, chiral rotation, the measure for vial fermions transforms uh, under something which is this times k, where k is the instant number. And so uh, if you look back at the matter content of the n equal to 2 vector multiplet, there were two gay genus. Uh, and if you are careful about little art symmetry, as well, I didn't say that, but let me, let me say that. So, so remember we had this, sorry. So we are going to assign r equal minus one, r equal minus a half, and r equal to zero, whereas for the, for the half hyper, this is our assignment. And with this assignment, you can convince yourself that the anomaly precisely cancels when the beta function is zero. Okay, so in uh, n equal to two uh, theory with vanishing one loop beta function, First of all, the beta function vanishes to all orders. So the theory is truly scale invariant. You have an exact SU2 R times U1 R symmetry, but then let me assert without further ado that, so that we have scale invariance. D, we have R symmetry, SU2. R times U1R, and then of course we have Poincaré, and as is familiar, the scale invariance and the Poincaré invariance will join, will enhance to the conformal algebra. So I should perhaps write it here. We have Poincaré symmetry, so we have Lorentz generators, and we have momenta, and these will enhance to the full S of four comma two or SU two slash two conformal algebra. And in fact, we have supersymmetry and okay, so let me just write it and then we'll comment on it. There will be a enhancement of the super algebra to the full fledged. Uh, superconformal algebra, which um, okay. So again, uh, almost each of the same as I make would require a separate lecture. So I need to take it for granted that you know what the conformal algebra is. So the additional generators that you find here are so the momenta now come with partners, which are the special conformal generators. In space-time dimension D, we have D additional special conformal generators. And then if you have Poincaré supercharges, they come accompanied by their conformal analogs, which are conventionally denoted by S. And furthermore, the full structure will close on the right-hand side of the commutators of Q and S, you will also find generators of the full art symmetry, so that the whole superalgebra uh, is, in fact, SU2 slash 2, SU2 comma 2 slash 2. Okay, I'm going to discuss the structure superalgebra a little bit more in detail in a minute, um, 
but that's the story. Okay, so uh, questions about this? Okay, I need to be ruthless because otherwise I'm never, I'm never going to get to the heart of the matter. Um, so what are the features that I'd like to emphasize? Uh, first of all, you can now solve a fun combinatorial hazard size, which, of which many aspects were known a uh, long time ago, but there was a nice paper by uh, Tachikawa and collaborator who did a systematic analysis, missing one example, um, where you can take this discrete data, which is the choice of the product gauge group and the choice of the pseudo real representation of the gauge group, and this condition that the one loop beta function must vanish, and classify all possibilities for n equal to super conformal Lagrangians. That's a fun exercise. I'm not going to go into it. But let me just mention some prominent examples. One um, thing you can do just for the fun of it is to assume that the um, gauge group is a product of SU n factors and uh, further assume that the matter comes into bifundamental representation of any two of these SUN uh, gauge groups. And then you will probably have encountered this fun quiver notation where we have, I mean, uh, sorry, I missed your lecture. Perhaps you had quivers. Where we uh, have a little blob with an N1 here, and then we have an N2 here. And these are, this, this means that we have an SU1, SUN1, and this means that we have an SUN2 gauge group. It's a way of encoding uh, the structure of the gauge group, and the fact that we are connecting them by a line means that we have a full hyper in the bifundamental representation of the um, SUN1 times SUN2. And then the question is, what kind of quiver diagrams you can draw that are conformal? And the answer turns out to be very beautiful. First of all, um, okay, I don't have, uh, it's a fine exercise to do in detail on the black, but I, don't have, I really don't have the time. Um, one thing you can do, well, you can easily convince yourself that, um, you, see, you need to ensure the vanishing of the, of the beta function at each node. So the beta function for, for this node gets a, remember the formula, it was minus 2HV plus 2C2R in the notations where I'm using um, notation for full hypermultiplets. And you will remember that the C2 of the fundamental is equal to 1 half. So from here we get for, if I focus on the contribution of the function from this gadget, I will find minus 2N plus 1 half times 2. And then I need to count how many hypermultiplets I have, but I clearly have n from this side, n from this side, because from the point of view of this gauge symmetry, this is just some global symmetry, and n from the other side, so I get 2n, and this is happily zero. And so clearly I can keep going, except that of course I don't quite know what to do at the end, and the simplest way to make this work is to just connect it back and write down a sort of circular quiver diagram with all SUN groups of equal rank. Uh, another way to win the game would be to end this story here. Uh, okay, let me call this 2N. Would be, be to end it this way. And then there are a couple, three more exotic possibilities, but the statement is that if you assume uh, that um, there are uh, no flavored symmetries. Uh, and if you assume that the gauge group takes a product with only SU n factors, all the possibilities are classified by drawing the, uh, dink the, aff the affine dinking diagrams for ADE. So there's this ADE affine classification. Okay, so this was a bit quick, but perhaps you have seen this before. Uh, 
then another fun example I could do would be the, uh, well, let me not draw it. There's also, there's also, so this is the A K hat, where K is the number of nodes. This would be the D K, and then you can go to our colleague Wikipedia and check the Dinkin diagrams for uh, E. And uh, anyway, these are all very nice examples of n equal to two superconformal field theories in four dimensions. You can do something also a little bit more elaborate where you assume we can improve our uh, set of we can enlarge our set of possibilities by assuming that uh, we can also have um, hypermultiple which are charge. So this would be a hypermultiplet which is in the bifundamental of this gauge group, SUN, but it also transform in the fundamental representation of some additional uh, symmetry group, K, SUK, which, however, is not gauged. So the standard notation is that we use circles to the not gauge groups and boxes to the not, to the not flavor groups. Uh, and so you can now enlarge your set of possibilities by decorating these quivers with this kind of boxes, and I will leave you with the answer, and then you can have some fun trying to argue for it. So if I have, um, let me call this V. If I consider a quiver of this type uh, with, in principle now I can have, I can decorate it with additional uh, flavored symmetries of this kind, then the condition that this be conformal at each node is this one, where Cij is the uh, Cartan matrix. So, um, okay, so this is just a very quick uh, list of possibilities to just impress upon you that there is a huge class of just Lagrangian theories. And the, uh, once you have, in, once you have uh, spent 10 seconds to be impressed by that, I'm gonna graduate and tell you that this set of Lagrangian theories of which I just enumerated a few examples by drawing quivers, are in fact just a tiny subset of what we now believe to be the full set of n equal to two superconformal field theories. And how do we know that? Well, we know that a bit indirectly. The simplest and perhaps um, from what I've told you so far, the simplest way to get to that conclusion is to try to take the strong coupling limit of uh, any one of these Lagrangian models and to realize that there is a duality transformation that will require the existence of another uh, superconformal field theory that cannot be written uh, in the language that I just described so far. Another way of doing this, of course, which is also related, is by constructing this more mysterious theory that do, cannot be written in this language from various decoupling limits of string theory or M theory. So the emerging picture is the following. So, so now we are um, getting into the more conceptual territory where I want to eventually go for for uh, the rest of the lectures, which is to try to delineate the full space of n equal to two superconformal field theories. And the, the emerging picture is the following. So here we had a nice separation between what you may want to call matter, which were the hypermultiplets or the half hypermultiplets, and gauge fields. And the continuous parameter of the theory, the complexified gauge coupling, were purely carried by the gauge field. Okay, so I'm going to speculate that uh, this is, uh, so the conjecture, the full space of n equal to two, d equal to four, superconformal field theories uh, 
arises by gauging uh, a set of isolated superconformal field theories of which the uh, free hypermultiple is the simplest example. Okay, so what this one can make it more precise, but the idea is that you have exotic type of matter. You have ordinary matter, which is the hypermultiplets. Those we understand because you can write down a free field Lagrangian for it. And then you have other kinds of matter, exotic matter, which is characterized by the idea that there are no continuous parameters. Okay, this, con this parameter tau that I had earlier is um, from the point of view of conformal field theory is what would be called an exactly marginal deformation. It's a deformation that preserves, uh, in this case, the full supersymmetry, but in fact, more to the point, the full superconformal symmetry of the model. And I'm going to, in, in some sense, call isotic matter a theory that has no exactly marginal deformation. It's a, it's a isolated fixed point of the renormalization group. And the only such theory for which we can write down a Lagrangian model are the free hypermultiplets. And these other more mysterious type of matter theories should be understood as some strongly coupled um, isolated fixed point that we must describe more abstractly. But the idea is that we can then treat it as an abstract beast and introduce parameters by gauging some subalgebra of the global symmetry algebra of these theories. And this is the only way in which you can get exactly marginal deformations. Or to say differently, the picture of the, um, of the space of exactly marginal couplings of a general n equal to two superconformal field theories looks a little bit like this, where this cusp point corresponds to points where uh, the gauge couplings, at least one of the gauge couplings in my product gauge group is going to zero. And at this point, you will decouple a piece that has no marginal deformations, and, um, and this is clearly a special point. Okay, am I making sense? So there are familiar examples of this story where one point is perfectly described by Lagrangian tools. You have a bunch of hypermultiples coupled to gauge fields, and then you go to some other point where you recognize that in that limit, some other gauge group is becoming weakly coupled, and what you're left with is a product of perhaps familiar stuff like hypers, but also unfamiliar stuff that has uh, no obvious Lagrangian description. Okay, and the full set of theories is obtained by gluing together these elementary pieces, making sure that the beta function is zero. And, and so really one of the main uh, goals of our abstract considerations when we graduate to this chiral algebra correspondence is to be uh, an under, uh, understanding of these strongly coupled pieces. Okay, so um, what next? So, um, since I'm, I mentioned this, let me also um, put a little bit of uh, more equations. Um, so remember, I wrote down this abstract, I wrote down this abstract uh, way in which I was describing the um, coupling, the minimal coupling of the gauge field to some um, conserved current, and you will recognize that if my picture is correct, I get to treat the gauge fields using a conventional type of Lagrangian, but it might be that the, what the gauge field coupled to is something that does not have a, a, a simple Lagrangian description. Nevertheless, I can think of this uh, moment multiple that contains a conserved current abstractly and and so we'll be coupling the gauge field to some uh, conserved current of my strongly coupled piece 
and then I can rephrase the vanishing of the beta function in this um, purely um, abstract way by declaring that my conserve, um, so, so this will become a little bit more clear once we graduate to, um, to conform a representation theory. But the idea is that the, the strongly coupled theory may have uh, as, a, as a certain symmetry algebra and corresponding there is a conserved current associated with the symmetry algebra. And I can define the level abstractly in some normalizations that I need to be uh, quick, write, write rather quickly because I don't have time to get into these, all these details. There's a way to, um, to normalize the currents um, that um, um, so a conserved current has dimension three and so you see that dimensionally this works. And the uh, non-abelian structure constant fix uniquely this normalization. So I have then meaningful data is contained in the two-point function. And this is the level of my four-dimensional current algebra. And then, um, and then in those conventions, you can write down the condition for the banishing of the beta function in this more abstract way. Okay, I don't know if I'm making sense. This, of course, will reproduce the condition that I had earlier for in the case where, where I can uh, think of the current as a composite field of free hypermultiplets, but the more general abstract condition is this one. And so this is the first baby step towards this sort of more abstract viewpoint that we want to take. We want to think, this, we want to think of these theories as uh, uh, defined abstractly in terms of a set of local operators and their operator product expansions and um, and then even something as pedestrian as the vanishing of the beta function can be, uh, can be said in that purely absurd language. Okay, so um, how am I doing with time? Okay, so, um, okay, so this is about half of what I want to cover, but um, I will have to be a little bit ruthless next time. Um, okay. <clears throat> 